Good morning. I've been grading the um, submissions so far. Um, I'm about halfway through them at this point, the, uh, the pipe networks that you submitted. Um, for the most part, it seems like things went pretty well with water gems. Um, you know, one of the persistent weaknesses of water gems is that um, printing out the PDFs is a little bit funny. It's tricky to tell it what you want to print and not have a ton of white space. And I mean, I've, when I've tried doing my own prints, I can sometimes make it a little bit better, but it's really uh, it's not the way it ought to be for a program that the professional version, they're charging thousands of dollars a seat. Um, but, I mean, it does the hydraulic calculations nicely, and I guess if I had to pick between the two, I'd pick uh, good hydraulic calculations and a little bit less well-developed printing facility. All right, this is our last class meeting before spring break. Hope that's not a surprise to anybody. You're going to have a hard time booking tickets at this point. Um, on Tuesday after spring break, you've got homework 10 due. Then homework 11 on Thursday, and that same day we're going to have um, an exam in class. And so uh, you can expect to see some paper calculations on that problem related to the three chapters we've been covering since the first midterm exam. And I'm also going to throw in a water gems question. And I can't give you any hints on that because I haven't written it yet. And also because I don't want to. <laughs> so. Any questions related to the announcements? All right. Well, today we're going to continue talking about enlargements and contractions. Remember that in class on Tuesday, the first kind of channel contraction that we considered is the case of what if a channel is effectively narrowed by putting piers in, and how that has the potential to change the water depth as the water approaches that pier. And what we saw for the subcritical example that we considered was actually the velocity increased and the water depth decreased by putting those piers in. Uh, we'll look at contractions and enlargements more generally today, including how we can account for energy losses that may occur when a channel changes width. All right. Um, so remember that for a rectangular channel, it's often useful to consider the flow per unit width lowercase q. So lowercase q is big Q divided by B. So big Q is the volumetric flow rate, B is the channel width, and for a rectangular channel, the top width and the bottom width are going to be the same. Um, but this flow per unit width, one of the ways that we've used it is calculating the critical depth, y sub c, because that's the flow per unit width squared divided by g to the one-third power. So it's a handy way to calculate the critical depth. And remember, what we know about the critical depth is that that's the depth for the most efficient flow. And it's also the depth associated with the minimum amount of specific energy required to convey a certain volumetric flow rate through a channel. Like, we can have 10 cubic meters uh, per second going through a channel and require a lot of different amounts of energy to do that but the least amount of energy is always going to be to have that water flowing at the critical depth. So here what you're seeing is that the channel width decreases and big Q is the same in the wide section and the narrow section, but we have a different flow per unit width after decreasing the channel width. All right. So um, consider the specific energy diagrams that we've seen before. And the effect of changing that channel width is that, number one, when you make the channel narrower, now the critical depth is going to change. Now look at the formula for critical depth. If you have a smaller b, then lowercase q is bigger for the same flow rate. You know, if we have that same 10 cubic meters per second, but now it's flowing through a narrower channel, then flow per unit width is a bigger number than it was before when we had this wide section. So that means y sub c at section 2 is deeper. So your critical depth is going to be deeper when you have a narrower channel. So the specific energy diagram, because of that deeper 
critical depth is shifted up. This diagram uh, that's shown here on the screen, um, our original specific energy, energy diagram was this one, the one on the left. So what we're saying is, is that when you made the channel narrower, it increased the critical depth. And so we have the original critical depth, and this Y prime C is the critical depth for the narrower channel. So it's lifted upwards. But what you'll notice is it's also shifted to the right. And it's shifted to the right because of the specific energy having changed. Does anybody remember the shortcut relationship I've told you between specific energy and critical depth that applies for a rectangular channel? Three halves or two thirds, depending on how you're looking at it. So E minimum is three halves y sub c. So what that means is for a certain flow rate, the minimum specific energy, which we know is associated with critical flow, well, during critical, during critical flow, two-thirds of the energy is tied up in the depth. One-third of the specific energy is tied up in the velocity head. So if we know the depth, we can calculate the full amount of minimum specific energy by multiplying it by three halves. And so what this is saying is that this flow per unit width condition two is shifted to the right because now there's more specific energy required. So remember this point of the critical depth, also we can carry it down. And that's specific energy. And so this curve is a combination of lots of different depths, lots of different flow depths it can, that can convey the same flow rate. But the minimum amount of specific energy for a certain flow rate corresponds to the critical depth. And when we make the channel narrower, what you need to remember, and also be able to explain why, is that when you have a uh, narrower channel, it makes the critical depth go up and shift it to the right. So any questions so far? All right. Well, let's do some calculations just to get an initial feel for what happens when we narrow the channel um, with this kind of a transition. Um, this one I'll do on the board. The next one I'm going to turn you loose on. This one's kind of uh, just to illustrate a different way to do some of the calculations than we may have seen before. Um, at section one here, before it's narrowed, the channel is 10 feet wide. The flow depth is five feet. And we know the uh, average velocity is three feet per second. So this question is asking, how narrow could we make the channel before choking occurs? And we did a similar question in the past where, like, how far can you take something before there's choking? Uh, that previous example was what we were doing is we were increasing the step height. And do you remember what was the flow condition that, um, that we see going over that step that's the tallest step that we can go before there's choking? What kind of uh, conditions are going over that step? What is it? Um, no, it, it'll begin to be unsteady if we go beyond that maximum step height, because then it'll start to choke. So when, when you take the uh, delta Z as high as possible, like the maximum limit, what we say is, by definition, that maximum step height is the step height that's going to cause critical flow above the step height. So when we did that similar example before, what we did was we said, Let's assume that we have critical flow at 2, and we're solving for un some unknown z. We're going to be doing a similar thing here. What we're saying is, we're going to make that channel narrower. And when we make it narrower, that's going to change the, uh, the depth at 2. Here's the relationship, by the way. What we're saying is, specific energy at 1 is equal to the specific energy at 2. There's no delta z in this one, like there was when we were doing the steps down and up. There's no delta z. So it's just the specific energy is constant, 
the allocation has changed. When we make the channel narrower, we're going to change the, uh, the depth and we're going to be increasing the flow per unit width. Q, lowercase q, is going to be higher. So that's maybe an indication that the depth is going to decrease when we do that. So it'll be the critical depth. So we're going to keep making that channel narrower and narrower and narrower until we force the flow to the critical depth. And then if we made it any more narrow, it would start to choke. All right. So um, the first thing I'm going to do is calculate how much specific energy is there at 1. So the specific energy at 1 is y1 plus v1 squared divided by 2g. We'll calculate the velocity head the old-fashioned way. Since we've got the velocity, we might as well. All right, so that's saying that the energy at 1 is 5 feet plus uh, 3 feet per second squared. So that's the velocity divided by 2 times 32.2 feet per second squared. Uh, so the velocity head component, that is just 0 0.140 feet. So there's not much energy in the velocity head upstream. The total energy is 5.140 feet. So that's our specific energy at 1. What we're saying is that same amount of energy will be at 2. So E2 is 5. 0.140 feet. And what we're doing is we're making the channel narrower and narrower to force critical flow. And what's the specific energy when you've got critical flow? Well, it's the minimum specific energy. And so it's going to be a condition, uh, the E minimum at 2 is 5.140 feet. So critical depth depth of flow associated with minimum specific energy. Okay. And our little shortcut tells us that if we have minimum specific energy, then we can uh, know the allocation between critical depth and how much of the energy is in the velocity head. So in other words, the y sub c is going to be 2 thirds of how much of the energy there is, and 2 thirds the E minimum. So here it's going to be 2 thirds of 5.140 feet, 3.427 feet. Um, so we're saying we know what the critical depth is going to be because we know how much energy there is. You know, energy is our currency. We've got 5.14 feet of energy at 2. And two-thirds of that energy is going to be tied up in the depth when it's critical flow. And so then that means the depth will be 3.427 feet. So then uh, the only, the last thing remaining for us to do then is to find out how that corresponds to the width of the channel. If that's going to be the flow depth, how wide will the channel be? Um, there's a couple of different ways for us to know. First of all, um, we could do Q equals VA, right? And so we've got um, Q is from at 1, it was uh, a times V, and so we had 10 feet times 5 feet times our velocity of 3 feet per second. So 150 cubic feet per second. Um, and let's see, at 2 we know the depth and the width. So A2 is going to be, oh no, we, we don't yet know the width. 
we know that the depth is going to be um, 3.427 feet. So that's the y, and then it's going to be also multiplied by b. So that's our area. And the uh, velocity can be calculated because we know what the velocity head is. Um, let me erase the top part of the whiteboard here. So remember, we said that of the 5.140 feet of energy, 3.427 is in the depth. So 5.140 feet minus 3.427 feet means that how much is remaining for the uh, velocity head? Let me do the calculations. I don't have that specifically written down in my solutions. I've got an HP emulator on my Android phone, so it's all good. 5.14 minus 3.427. All right, so there's 1.713 feet uh, as velocity head. So remember, the total energy is the depth and the velocity head. So total minus depth gives you how much energy is tied up in the velocity head. Um, so that much energy, we're saying um, 1.713 feet is V, um, that's the uh, V squared divided by 2G. And we're talking about the velocity at location 2. Okay, so V2 is going to be 2 times 32.2 feet per second squared times 1.713 feet. And then we have to take the uh, square root of all of that. And I think what we'll find is that the velocity at 2 should be 10.50 feet per second. And remember, this is at the extreme condition of we've made the channel as narrow as possible. So does everybody understand the rationale so far? Like what we said was the energy at 1 and the energy at 2 were equal. And the minimum width is the width that is just forcing critical flow conditions at 2. And so we said well, we can calculate the critical depth using the flow per unit width. So we found the critical depth. We set the critical depth at 2. And now we're just kind of finding out where the rest of the energy is. And so we have a velocity of 10.50 feet. Um, so that means that the Q is A times V. So our flow rate is 150 CFS, and it's coming from the velocity, 10.5 feet per second, times the width, B, which is unknown, times the depth, which we calculated to be 3.427 feet. Okay, so only one unknown there. And let's just double check that this all works out as I hope it does. We have 150 divided by 10.5 divided by 3.427. And that gives us that the minimum width is 4.17 feet. So B is 4.17 feet. We make it narrower than that, the flow is going to choke. Um, if we make it wider than that, 
it's not going to force critical conditions at 2. And the question asked, what's the narrowest channel possible? So we could have gone narrower if we make it, like, for example, 4.2 feet, then the flow conditions aren't quite critical downstream at location 2. All right. Uh, so that one was uh, a little bit of abstract problem solving that you have to apply if you want to find the minimum channel width. Uh, let's do an example that's a little bit more direct and that also takes into account the ideas of energy loss. You remember when we were talking about um, enclosed conduit flow, the two different types of energy losses. When water goes through a pipe, there's the distributed losses, We're back. All right. Um, so the C value that you use, you know, it gives a range here. It depends on how gradually tapered that transition is. And the more gradual the transition, the lower the C value would be. What you can see is that the effect is that by adding the C value to the right side of the equation, where we assume that the water flows from 1 towards 2, well, we always put the head losses on the right side of the equation when we were using the energy equation with con closed conduit flow because the idea was that it was going to be having the effect of reducing the pressure, reducing the energy that's available at location 2. The same thing happens here. The energy at 1 is uh, you know, how much energy that potentially you could have at 2, but this energy loss is going to be reducing the amount of energy that's available to distribute between the depth and the velocity head at 2. All right, so let's use that, um, that idea. All right, in just a moment. Now, this is more of a, a thought example, and I think actually maybe I should move this slide in the future up here. It would make more sense. It's a little disjointed. Let's go with it, though. Um, so if we make the channel narrower, we talked about, do you remember with the narrower channel what direction it shifts the specific energy diagram when we made the channel narrower? To the right and up. It shifts it up because the critical depth is higher. It shifts it to the right because minimum specific energy depends on critical depth. And if you have more critical depth, you have more specific energy. Okay, so here, if the channel gets wider, then what that means is that the flow per unit width, lowercase q, is smaller after the channel gets wider because the lowercase b that's in the denominator for calculating uh, this q, if the channel is wider, then q is smaller, and so the critical depth is less. And so if we were going to sketch that out, if we were going to draw a sketch, and uh, you should do that in your notes. I'll do it here on the whiteboard. Let's have the before the channel changes its width and the after. Okay, so a specific energy diagram, by the way, um, if I was going to ask you in some sort of an assessment to sketch a typical specific energy diagram, I'd hope to see that you'd be able to label each axis. And so on the horizontal axis, that's specific energy. 
on the vertical axis, it's depth. Okay, so our uh, typical specific energy diagram would look like this. Um, it's not quite, later on when we're doing momentum depth diagrams, momentum depth diagrams look like this. They're kind of mirror image about a horizontal line. These aren't. A specific energy diagram is not a mirror image about a horizontal line. It has kind of a, uh, this one-to-one -one slope line. When you increase the uh, subcritical depths, it kind of traces that, whereas down here below the critical depth, uh, it doesn't follow any kind of a pattern like that necessarily. Okay, so specific energy diagram. This is uh, before the channel gets wider. After the channel gets wider, what it's going to do is it's going to shift the diagram down and to the right. And so our secondary diagram would, if this was the original critical depth, y sub c1, now I'm going to have to have a different y sub c. So this is going to be y sub c2. And it's going to have less specific energy. So it's maybe if I draw a dashed line just to depict that, you can see the after is lower and to the left. So be able to sketch it understand why and explain why and you'll be golden. Alright, so that was specific energy diagrams. Now back to the idea of energy losses. Um, so this energy loss term is on the right side of the equation and now I'd like you to get some practice calculating what will be the new depth. This is going to be the same thing in the past that we've done when we had the steps. You know how we created a cubic equation, we solved the three roots, we rejected the negative root, and then how did we know of the two remaining positive roots, how did we know whether to choose the big number or the small number of those two positive roots? Flow regime. So what we had to do is we had to look at, at the upstream section. So at one, we asked ourselves, um, our conditions supercritical or subcritical upstream and then after the change they'll stay in the same flow regime. So uh, hopefully that gives you an, a, a reminder of what, you, what process you should follow here. I'm not going to tell you directly step one, step two, step three and all of that but it's going to be very similar in approach to what you've done before. It's just that now there's no delta Z like there was when you were calculating the uh, um, the uh, contractions previously, and this time we are throwing in uh, some energy loss. The C value has been uh, identified as 0.45 for this transition. So see if you can find the new depth downstream if we make the channel width increase to 5.7 meters. The specific energy at 1 is equal to the specific energy at 2 plus the losses. So if you look at the equation, we know everything in this equation except for y2. That's going to be the only unknown. All right, so uh, let's see. The initial kind of stuff is calculating flow per unit width at 1, calculating the flow per unit width at 2, uh, determining the critical depth at 1. By the way, there's going to be two different critical depths, aren't there? Since the flow per unit width 
uh, varies, there's going to be a different critical depth upstream and downstream. So don't make the mistake of finding the uh, wrong critical depth. So we want to know what's the critical depth upstream before there was any transition. So that was 1.035 meters. And uh, from that, we can compare it to the flow depth. The flow depth was greater than critical, and that means subcritical conditions. And that's later on going to help us to identify which of the routes we should select. All right, so the uh, two components of energy is the depth and the velocity head. And it looks like the vast majority of the energy is tied up as the depth. That's going to be the case with subcritical flow. So the amount of specific energy at 1 is 2.823 feet. Is this feet or meters? I guess this is meters. Meters. Uh, and then that's going to be equal to the energy at 2 and the losses. So you can see that uh, what I did, I guess, is uh, over here, um, this is going to be uh, a factor that you can tie together with the first term because they're both dependent on the, uh, the depth, y2. So did anybody else get a depth of about 2.8 meters? Good. All right. That's it for chokes, uh, contractions, expansions. What I want to talk about now with you is phase three of the project. This is something that you can begin immediately if you choose, even before you get any feedback from me on your pipe sizing. Um, some of you, it's clear, have already optimized your pipe network all the way. And, you know, I'm able to, after so many semesters of looking at these maps, I can look and see when I think a pipe is maybe not quite optimized all the way. And by the way, what I mean by that, it not optimized all the way, is uh, I think it could be made a bit smaller and you still not go below the minimum pressure of 240. So in the comments, if I say, you know, like, keep optimizing your pipe, that's what I mean. Is I mean, as I look through your pipe network, I see some pressures that are high enough above the limit that I think you could have probably nudged at least one pipe diameter a little bit lower. All right, so this you can start on even before you get those feedback, uh, that feedback from me. The way that you are uh, causing your pipe network to be pressurized, of course, is by where you lo locate the uh, reservoir up on the hill. How many of you have your reservoir around 260 meters? Did you all tell each other that's where it should go? Or did you figure that out through iteration and hard work? Yeah, if you go any higher on the hill, if you make it 261 meters, then what you're going to find is that, uh-oh, now I've got spots in my network where the pressure is above 850. And if you don't go that high up on the hill, then you're essentially, you're making your pipe network bigger than it otherwise would need to be. Because the higher you can put that on the hill, that's going to allow you to make the pipe network smaller and smaller and smaller because you're getting the pressure by having it up there. But the other reason why you have that reservoir is not just to pressurize the network. It's uh, also to kind of steady out the availability of water over time. Um, these tanks help to uh, cushion the, uh, the spikes of demand. And um, what we're assuming in this project, and it's a pretty good assumption, is that uh, our water's coming from a spring that uh, we can draw a steady flow rate from. Now, even if it wasn't coming from a spring, even if it's coming from a water treatment plant, water treatment plants operate most efficiently at a constant flow rate um, because it's uh, really challenging to suddenly double or triple the flow rate coming out of a water treatment plant in the evening compared to the nighttime hours. You know, there's variations in the chemicals that are used for disinfection. There's variation in how much uh, coagulant is being used to remove turbidity. There's just, you know, a lot of moving parts in a water treatment process. And so it's most efficient if you just keep things steady. And so regardless of where your water source is, whether it's a river, a well, a spring, um, it would be great if you can just be drawing the same constant flow rate into a reservoir and then the water going out of the reservoir is going to change a lot. 
And so you're going to have to figure out how large the tank should be to account for the fact that the flows are going up and down during the day. In a previous homework assignment, I asked you to digitize this curve on an hour-by-hour -hour basis. Do you remember that? Um, here's my attempt to digitize that curve. So you can see, for instance, that uh, I used this uh, top one, the maximum day for the year, and I said at uh, midnight it's at 100% of the average daily flow. So on the maximum day of the year, at midnight, you're using the average amount of flow rate. But on the maximum day of the year, around 8 p.m., you're using about 2.8 times the flow rate that you ordinarily would. I said 274%. Uh, Boy, I'm not sure how I got that precise. But it looks like I made an effort to try and capture some of the uh, curvature of this best I could. The blue line is the line that you choose so that half of the area is underneath the curve and half of the area is above the curve. Now think about why that would be. What we're talking about is a tank that through a daily cycle is going to be filled and then emptied through this daily cycle of the maximum day. And most days, it won't be emptied all the way. It's only going to be emptied all the way on this design day, which is 30 years in the future on a hot afternoon where there's a sporting event going on and a couple of fires and blah, blah, blah. You know the routine for what our design condition is. But we've got this tank, and there's flow coming in and flow going out. The flow going in is steady. The flow going out is unsteady. And in the evening, like after that big daily surge is over, so it looks like, what, about 11 p.m.? What finally starts to happen at 11 p.m. is that tank begins to fill. Looking at in versus out, if the tank is filling, what does that tell you? In is bigger than out. So if the tank is filling, in is greater than out. So what happens is that through the night, that tank gets deeper and deeper, and then any time the flow out is bigger than in, the water volume in the tank decreases. So how big should the tank be? Well, what we have to do is we have to do an hour-by-hour -hour analysis of in versus out, and what we're looking for is the maximum amount of volume that has to be stored in order to make sure that we've got enough to get us through that big surge of demand. And so look at this blue line versus the curve. What it looks like is that there's a morning rush where during this morning rush there's a little bit more demand coming out of the tank than flowing in. But then when everybody's at work, the tank is filling briefly. Anytime this black line is below, below the blue line, that means the tank is filling. But then the, the tank begins to drain when you've got a big surge of evening demand. So I'm going to demonstrate for you the spreadsheet process you can follow in order to calculate the required size of the reservoir. All right, so let me uh, start up Excel. And what we're going to do is we're going to consider a specific set of numbers here in this example. Let's say that uh, we knew our peak demand is 400 liters per second. Each of you has a known peak demand, right? That's the bottom box on the demand summary sheet that you have submitted in part one. So the overall total for your network, you know what that is. And that's your peak demand. So what we say is that is this point right here, the top peak. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that top peak is 400 liters per second. And uh, I'm assuming that my inflow is the average demand through the day. I'll tell you what I mean by that. But 
what I want to do is I want to begin by looking at when does the reservoir just barely start to fill. That period during the night when finally the big surge of daily demand is over and the tank is filling. Because we want to make sure the tank is big enough that during the overnight period when we're filling it up, we've got enough volume there so that it doesn't overflow. I'm going to copy this data. You shouldn't use my data for the uh, project. You should use the digit digitization that you did for your homework assignment. So you've already got this same thing. Um, so the columns I'm going to create, um, let me just insert a couple of rows here because I know my uh, design peak flow is 400 liters per second. That's what this example said was our peak demand. Okay, so always including the units. Okay, 400 liters per second. And um, let's consider the outflow in terms of uh, liters per second. This percentage means that the, uh, the flow out is just going to be the peak times the percent of peak. So if my peak demand is 400 liters per second, at midnight I'm only having 144 liters per second go out of the reservoir. I can double click and then that passes the same formula through the rest. And let's make sure that we are seeing, yeah, 100% of the demand during when we know that that peak is in the evening hour. Okay, so this was liters per second. It's a, a Q. Let's also find the uh, volume out during the hour. And this is going to be cubic meters. Let me wrap this text. All right. So if it's 144 liters per second and it occurs for an hour, and I want to know how many cubic meters happen during the hour, what I say is it's the flow rate times the time. So there's 3,600 seconds in an hour. So now I know how many liters flow out of the tank during the 12 o'clock hour. But I want to know not liters, I want to know cubic meters. So I divide by 1,000. Okay. So see if that makes sense. What we say is that during the 12 o'clock hour, there's 144 liters per second flowing out. So the incremental volume is going to be 518 cubic meters because we, uh, we said this liters per second occurs over 3,600 seconds, and then we convert from liters to meters. Okay, then I just distribute that same calculation down through all of them. So that's the flow out. Now, I am defining the flow in as the average of all the flows out. Because if I don't, over the course of the day, if I don't have the same flow in and the flow out, then either the tank is going to overflow or it's going to run dry. So just the assumption is that during a 24-hour cycle, in equals out. Even though during one individual hour, in doesn't equal out. And so um, I'm going to calculate the, uh, the average flow out. And I guess I'll be consistent. I'll put in the units there, liters per second. Okay, so the average flow out is, uh, I'll do equals average of all of these. All right. I don't remember if that's the number I'm looking for. Yeah, it is. No, no, something's wrong. Oh, okay. No, it's right. 253.7. I have 2.53.5 here. All right. Um, so uh, over the 24-hour cycle, flow in equals flow out. So the steady state 
inflow must equal the average outflow, just as a reminder to myself. So what I'm going to have now is a column where it's the flow into the tank, again in liters per second. So the flow in, I'm just going to refer to this calculated uh, 253. And it's always the same flow rate coming into the tank. It's coming from some spring or a treatment plant. But the point is, is that we want the purpose of the tank is to kind of equilibrate the difference between the inflow and the outflow. And we do the same thing where we're going to calculate the volume in during the hour in cubic meters. Okay, so that's again going to be this number times 3600 divided by 1000. All right, now we have to look at the data. Um, at what point in the evening does the tank begin to fill? Is the tank filling or emptying at 8 o'clock? Let's look at the 8 o'clock hour. Is the water level getting deeper or less deep during the 8 o'clock hour? Less deep, because during the 8 o'clock hour, uh, the outflow is greater than the inflow. So if we look at the flow out, it's 400, but the inflow is 253. So it's not during the 8 o'clock hour that the tank starts to fill. What about the 9 o'clock hour? No. Still emptying. 11 o'clock, still emptying. That was 10. 11, now it starts to fill. So this is the, the step that sometimes students forget. When the tank just barely starts to fill, we need to take that row and put it at the top of the list. Because we're going to do like a flow accumulation. I have to set it aside for a second so I can make room. Insert. All right. So let me drop that in to the top of the list. So I'm going to write a note. You'll have it here in this video if you want to revisit. Um, put the data at the top where the tank just starts to fill for the first time in the evening. And the, we, the reason we do that is we assume that the tank was empty, that uh, it just barely starts to, uh, to fill during the 11 o'clock hour. But we had designed it so that uh, that last cubic meter of water got sucked out during the 10 o'clock hour, and now finally the flow in is greater than the flow out. So you have to put, you have to resort the data a little bit. Now let me make that less ridiculous to look at. All right, so then the, uh, the next thing we're going to calculate is the hourly change in volume. So here is the uh, hourly change in volume in cubic meters. And so we're asking ourselves, well, let me even be more direct about that, in minus out. So it's the difference in uh, what's happening to the amount of water during this hour. So during the 11 o'clock hour, in is 920 cubic meters. Out is 734. So that means during the hour, we've got 185 cubic meters of water going into the tank. And so we can do that for all of them. And we find out that, as we already know, in the evening it's positive. That means it's filling. If it's negative, that means that out is bigger than in. All right, so the last thing that we have to do is uh, we have to calculate the uh, accumulated storage volume. And this is, again, to be in cubic meters. Do you remember what I said about 11 o'clock? How much water was there in the tank at uh, 1059? 10.59 and 59 seconds. The tank's empty. There's no water in there. So it's just barely starting to fill for the first time at 11 o'clock. 
So right now, the volume in the tank at 11 o'clock is zero, but after the 11 o'clock hour, it's going to have this much. So the accumulated volume for the first hour is just how much came in. Now what about uh, after the 12 o'clock hour? How much water is in the tank after that hour? Exactly. So it's how much was in there at the starting of the period plus the change that's associated with that period. So equals the cell above plus the cell to the left. Now, here's where the magic happens. And if we set this up right, it should go to zero at the end. So it shows that the, uh, hmm. well, isn't that a pickle? I wonder what I did wrong here. Volume out. I know what the issue is. So let's check the percent numbers here. All right, 51, 36, 34, 52, 36, 40, 48, 55, 66, 75. There's this error that I think I've got the wrong numbers in the slide compared to how I actually digitized it on a spreadsheet. No, it looks good. Hmm. Flow out, okay, goes at 292. The flow rate in. Uh, I wonder if this is going to change the average. No. Oh, it's when I resorted everything, so it's not including the top one anymore. You remember how I put the 11 o'clock hour at the top? So my average got changed when I resorted it. So don't make the same mistake that I did. All right. So this number was 253.5 before I resorted it and it screwed up my average. There it goes. So all right. So what it means is at the beginning of the 11 o'clock hour, it's empty. It goes through this process of filling at night, and then it drains back down to zero again. Now what we have to do is find what is the max of that. Because this is how much water is going to be needed inside of the tank. And so I want to find the, uh, the highest of all those values. It's the one that's 2520. So where is that? This is the maximum amount of uh, water that gets stored. So um, this is the required volume. Required volume that must be stored. So so design the tank to be 1.25 times this size. So let's say uh, tank size equals 1.25. Just as a safety factor, you make it 25% bigger than the uh, maximum volume that you actually observe. So this is how big I'm going to build my tank. And I think in the given data that I have in the handout for the project, I tell you, two tanks and the known size uh, cost relationship. And so what you should do is a linear interpolation with that given data. And if this size that you get is beyond that data, then it's going to be an ex uh, extrapolation. So you don't just buy the tank size that's closest. You actually use that, um, that given tank data so that you can approximate how much your tank is going to cost. All right, so you've seen the procedure. There's a uh, video that will be posted on YouTube that shows this same thing, as well as the, uh, the cautionary note to be careful that when you reorder the time series data, it doesn't throw off your average. But the indicator that you've done it right is that at the end of the daily cycle, it should go back down to zero. That means that you have equilibrium between the flow in and the flow out. All right. I guess that's uh, spring break then. I'll see you on Tuesday, the uh, 2nd of April.